It scares me to my core every single time I say it. I'm a professional speaker. I say it a fair bit. Business is good. Yet, why do I use it? If it scares me so much, why do I remind myself time and time again of that incident? It drives me. Now, I want to talk about this. There's a lot of what I'm going into because my company, Leadership Group, specialises in leadership. That's what I do. Yeah? There's driving, and what else is there? Inspiring. Inspiring, leading towards. Inspiring, the Latin derivative of the word inspire is aspare. Aspare means to breathe breath. It actually means to breathe God's breath. It means to, you know, you get a small, you get a small balloon and you, you blow into it. The balloon's bigger than it was, isn't it? But the actual material of the balloon was always there, wasn't it? It just wasn't taking up much space. This talk, as late as it may be, and it'll be short and sharp, is about you taking up more space, yeah? The reason I open up my talk with that footage is because it scares me to my core. Not about what happened. Not about what happened. I'll do, t- I'll do what happened ten times over compared to what didn't happen afterwards. You with me? See, what happened was nothing compared to the five years of not living that followed. See, what happened was this. We're crossing the Antarctic Peninsula. Antarctic Peninsula is the big bit of ice that comes out from Antarctica towards South America, towards Ushuaia, fin del mundo, end of the earth. And there I am with my mate from school, Jay Watson, and we're crossing from the eastern side to the western side. Two years in the planning and a month on the ice, and we're coming over here, and we're on the last day of this very successful expedition. I say very successful because we were both alive. <laughs> and there we are, and we're descending. And there's Charcot Bay, our pickup point. And we're coming to our pick-up, pick-up point, and I'm saying, oh, mate, there's a great big crevasse ahead of us there. A crevasse is a wee opening in the ice. Now, Antarctica is the size of America and Australia put together. The average ice thickness is 3,000 metres. That's the average ice thickness. So when you see a wee little crack in Antarctica, it's quite a big crack. And it goes for a long way. And I said to Jay-Z, mate, it's not safe walk, walking down there. Let's stay put. So we've got their ice picks. Dig, 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 dig. Make a ledge and dig the tent in and put an ice wall behind it. Protect it from any ice falls or rock falls or, or uh, snow falls. Woke up the next morning. It was blowing 60 knots. You know, you, you live in a coastal town. 60 knots is like 100 kilometres an hour. It was... Squashing the tent like this. I said, mate, Jay-Z, mate, we've got two days emergency rations. Let's stay put. Let, let's not walk today. Let's stay an extra day because it's not, to, not worth taking on that crevasse. You with me? So he stayed put. And I said, Jay-Z, I'll step out of the tent and I'll go 20 feet over here to the sleds to get the, to get, to get the lunch. And I'm over here at the sleds. And we had a yellow box for breakfast and a red box for lunch and a blue box for dinner. So we're getting the lunch, right? Which box? Yellow. Yellow? Uh, Hands up yellow. Hands up blue. Hands up red. Okay, maroon. Okay, so I'm I'm getting the lunch out of this this maroonish box. And, uh, you know, have you ever been, like, next to a railway station or, you know, or or even the train, um, a railway station or even the airport sometimes, and you can feel the plane before you can see it? Well, I could feel the plane. I could feel the train just just like I'm on a trampoline bouncing up and down. This is Antarctica. It's bouncing on me. And I look up and I see rock and rubble and ice coming screaming down the mountain. And I scrambled back to get to the safety of the tent as quickly as I possibly could. But I didn't make it. Now, time goes past, and my friend Jay, my friend from school, is in the tent there, looking at the charts and so forth, and you can't hear anything because you're in a tent. And And finally he looks at his watch and he says, gee, Pete's been out there for a while. Jay comes with me to all my talks. Um, Okay, mate. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, he must have gone. But anyway, normally, normally he's in there. Anyway, he, <laughs> he looks out and he sees that both, both the sleds are gone and so is his best mate. He knows his best mate has to be in one of two places. Either he's been taken by that avalanche, you can see like an ice cream scooper, 
and he's been buried 12 kilometres down the mountain at Charcot Bay, down by the coast, and I'm dead. Or he's been taken by that avalanche and he's been thrown into the crevasse, the great big opening in the ice, and he's dead. Anyway, either way, now is the time for leadership. Like, here I am with my company specialising in teaching mums and dads and individuals and school groups and universities and corporations from around the world teaching leadership. And unfortunately, it's such a shame, we haven't got a leader. Because, like, my business card says leader. And I'm quite clearly the leader. I mean, Jesus. I mean, look, I've got a, I've got a book, um, A Step Too Far, bestseller. I've got a, a DVD, CD, uh, workbook program, Lucky Life Form. In fact, it says, how to unlock the leader from within. But we're in a pickle here because I'm down a hole. And Jay hasn't got any of these things. We really aren't a bit of bother here. Um, I've got, um, Jay hasn't got any of these, I've got you know, documentaries and stuff, probably teaches you how to lead. Anyway, Jay hasn't got these as well. And leadership definitely is, it's, it's something, it's, it's the clothes you wear, isn't it? Or it's the office, you, the corner office, or the M-Class Mercedes, or the business card. It's your mindset. It's your mindset. Thank you. Shake your hand. It's in your mind. Now, you've come here probably to get rich, yeah? Show me the money, yeah? I tell you, you want to get rich? Get rich in here first, yeah? Get this right, and this will follow. And please, don't take the scars I've got to learn the lesson. Just learn the lesson. Get your mind right, and the money will follow. That's what we're talking about tonight. I'm talking about mindset. Yes, I've got a program, and yes, all of my students are making somewhere between 3% and 10% every single month. No problem at all. And then it goes beyond that. And there are charitable contributions around the world. And I'll talk about that briefly. But that's the point of the story is it starts from within. Great poem I love by uh, T.S. Eliot. I shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of my exploring shall be to arrive where I started and to know the place for the first time. I'm talking about you knowing you and knowing what you want in your heart and then the rest will follow. Well, this fellow in this tent, even though he didn't have, unfortunately, the DVD, CD, workbook program, best-selling biography or documentaries, he had the mindset. And he came over with a rope. He anchored next to the tent, the harness. What's this called? What's this device called? Carabiner. And this one here. Oops, there he that's your carabiner, that's your belay device. Feed your rope into your carabiner. On your harness. Spin it round. Screw it up. And then just carefully to the edge of the crevasse. And he peered down and he could see the blood splattered body of his best friend. But he had to leave the harness and the rope because I fell beyond a rope length, and one man can only use half a rope, half up, half down. I fell 50 metres, that's, as Eric said, you know, 14 storeys of an office building. It's a long way. He took my ice pick, his ice pick and his crampons, and he goes chip, 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 down to a dead friend. When he came up really close to me, he saw I was alive. He assessed that I had broken bones in my leg, Crushed, pe crushed pelvis, suspected broken back, every rib on my left hand side broken, uh, fractured skull, uh, bleeding from the nose, ear and mouth, and pretty se severe brain damage. Most of that was Jay's assessment with regard to the brain damage. He already knew that. <laughs> Jay went to school with me. <laughs> For three days, Jay lay on me to give me his body temperature so I didn't die of hypothermia. At least that's his excuse. <laughs> it was a boarding school. <laughs> the reason Jamie has me close this day to anchor the message of today is to teach you what I didn't know. Because what I didn't know was that when Jay and his brother and, and, and John and, uh, and Nigel, who came three days later, they finally 
after taking it using, I think it was a, De a DeWalt uh, cordless drill, they took a door off the yacht, they, carried, they dragged a door up the mountain and they strapped me with gaffer tape to a door. The funny story John tells me is that they were, he and Andy, you know, three days have gone past, my, my femur is still out through my bum. It was actually out for six days, all up, my femur. So I've got a condition called avascular necrosis, so you know, I died. That's all, I'm metal from here to here. I went, I went buzzing at the airport just then. Anyway, um, John tells a story that they're going along for about 20 minutes, you know, hauling along there, and, and they got really heavy. And they're going, gee, the snow's heavy and so forth. And they look behind it, and, and the, um, the uh, doors turned over. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been upside down for 20 minutes, you know. And John just said to Andy, oh, poor bugger, he's dead. Anyway, I wasn't dead, but I came back to Australia and I didn't live. And the reason I'm spending my time here with you tonight is to teach you to live. Because having a pulse and justifying your existence through debt and guilt or whatever goddamn reason you might come up with yourself to do what is not your gift is not justified. The great speech by Nelson Mandela, you know, our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure. It is our light, not our darkness, which most frightens us. I'm asking you to use me as a guinea pig to have a little glimpse of your soul and think about what you're possible of. Because if you come here this weekend just to make money to pay off a, pay off a, a mortgage or uh, re replace your income, then get a ticket. Because you're, you're not dreaming anywhere near big enough for me. I want you to have a footprint on the world. I want to know the legacy of your imprint on this world in this lifetime so that those lives that follow you can remember your name. I want you to be, as you said before, I want you to be an inspiration. Aspare, to breathe breath, to breathe breath into others and to take others from being small to make them bigger. Does that sound like something worth doing? Yes. And it's a, thank you very much. And it's a hell of a lot more worthy than money, okay? Take it from a guy who's made a lot and lost a lot and made it again. It's not about that. It's about your imprint to others, okay? You see, we've all got a story, haven't we? We've got a story? Now tell me this. When the, generally, when does, can, can you, when does a story happen? Does a story happen in the past? The now or the future? Past. So, oh, woe is me. I got taken by an avalanche. I fell 50 metres. Da, da, da. Woe is me. Um, I had an aneurysm. They cut out 14 centimetres of my air water. Woe is me. I was born with a hole in my heart. I was six months, eight years old. Woe is me. I fell down an avalanche. My wife left me, took three kids. I lost $700,000. I couldn't work. I couldn't drive a car. I took my licence away. Woe is me. We've all got a frickin' story, haven't we? We can all go on. I mean, it's a, a make-up story, it's made up. But, you know, we've all got a story we could go on about, haven't we? Yep. Yeah. Now, if the story happens in the past and the person's living here in the now, but they haven't dealt with the emotions associated with the story and the emotions are as follows. Anger, sadness... My handwriting is worse than my spelling. Hurt. Can you read that? It doesn't matter which one of them it is. You, you, might, have, you might have a Molotov cocktail. I had a really good cocktail. I had a lot of anger. I had a lot of sadness. A massive amount of guilt. This money business, the 700K, and you know my family having to um, threatening to sell the family farm, which had been for the you know my father's generation, to sell a farm to fund my um, media, um, medical airlift in Hercules to get me back to Australia, all the rest of it. Huge guilt on this. But the point of the story is, how much do you think a person here who has dreams and aspirations of getting rich over here, if their fuel is driven from past pain, how likely is it really that they're going to create this abundant future over here? Not very. Because what happens is, there's a wall over here. It's not a very big wall. <laughs> it's an anachronom, isn't it? What does that anachronom stand for? 
And there is another one, isn't there? I won't say it. Anyway. <laughs> Everything and run. Okay. <laughs> the point of the story is... Now, let's just have a quick story for a second. Now, <laughs> what do you want? Just, let's just imagine. You've been through a Mojo program. You're, you're loving it. Money is no object. Time is no constraint. You can have whatever you want in the world. What do you want? Give it to me. Million bucks. What do you want? What do you want? Over here in the future. Choice. choice. That's the most expensive. But when you've got... Are you from New Zealand? Choice? Oh, no. Choice. Okay. <laughs> I've had some choice. I went over with Lissy over in Queenstown. Here's me bragging. I just did 173,000 vertical metres skiing this season. How's that? Not bad. The trading pro my trading program is called uh, Selling Insurance, the Passive Option. Emphasis on the word passive. <laughs> I don't want to be in front of a screen. Just put the order out there, make the money, and let me spend it. Anyway, um, choice. What would you be choosing? Yeah. A thing, anything. Travel. Travel. So you like travel, there's the world, there's the globe. There we go. What else we got? A motorbike. A motorbike. There we go. There's one chained up at the airport I saw today at the baggage counter. Right, right. A motocross one. There's a motocross. It's not a very good one. It's actually a tricycle. What else? <laughs> nice car. Nice car. What sort of nice car? Sports car. Sports car. That's a sports car. Right, hey, what else? Come on, you capitalist pigs. Your island, Necker Island. There you go. How's that? By yourself, you got some company? You got some company? No company? Okay. I was going to show off from doing the um, XYZ, or how do you do it? There you go. No, it's not very good. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've got an island, we've got a, we've got a car, we've got a trust school, we've got traveling around the world, and it's over here. Now, we can have these great big juicy goals over here, yeah, and you can drive your body hard to do it, but does anybody know anybody who's ever done this, that's had the big juicy goals over here, I'm going to do it, I'm going to lose some weight, I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to do this, I'm going to have a million bucks, all the rest of them, but just funny, it's funny, Woo, what's going on in their brain? Part A says, let's do it, and they're going for it, and they get within an inch of getting it, like the great big job interview or, the, or, or paying off the credit cards. You know, you're with me on this? Yeah? And they get really close to it, and then B. A goes, let's do it, and then B says, go away, you unworthy little tripe. Yeah? You know what I mean? And then part A says, no, 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 you know, I've read a book, I've went to Tony Robbins, I'm going to do it, and they're going for it bad. Yeah? And then bing, they're back over here. You with you on this journey? Anybody know it? I know it's not you, but do you know anybody who's ever been on this journey of the self-saboteur? Yeah. It'll only go on forever, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all good with that. And by the way, can we just have a little, a little show of hands? And I just get my eyes picked up if you don't do it. Does anybody here... Um, have a voice, a little voice. I won't ask you, I'm not going to, this is an Oprah. Anybody got a voice? If you haven't got your hand up now, I mean, I'm going to come and um, say hello. Where does, your, where does your live? Mine lives here. Where does your live? Just point where your voice lives. Yeah, there, and on the brain, yeah. Yeah, and it's a really constructive little thing, isn't it? It's always saying positive things about how wonderful you are and how you can do anything, doesn't it? They don't call it the self-critic for nothing, yeah? Its role is to criticise. And it'll only do it positively. It'll only do it all the time. But you know what? And I've done. I mean, I've studied a lot of science behind here because I wanted to work out. I wanted to work out what was going on with my life because yeah, I've got a metal hip now, and you know, there's a scar here from a drip in Chile, which you know, I, was in, I was in drugs for so long. I was in Chile, and you know, that all got fixed medically. But I got really interested in the psychology of what's going on. Like I'm a competent, you know, private school bachelor of commerce educated uh, guy who used to be a lecturer and master of finance at university. Quite a competent guy, but I couldn't work. Well, I told myself I couldn't work. You know, all this language. The word couldn't. Anybody ever said anything themselves which involved I can't or I'm only? Yep. Yeah? Well, we never do it again. Just period, never do it again. I want to tell you what it is. It's called a nominalisation. A nominalisation is when you take a, noun, a, 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 a verb and you turn it into a noun. 
It's like saying, um, this is a wooden table, right? This is a wooden table, right? This is a wooden table? Yeah, what is it? Wooden table. What's this? What was it once? A tree. When it was a tree, what could it be? Anything. Anything. Like what? A house. A house that somebody could live in. Yeah, what else? A boat that somebody could sail around the world in. What else? Furniture. Furniture somebody could sit in. What else? A shade that somebody could lie beneath. All these things this wonderful tree could be when it was full of possibilities and life. Yeah? But when the tree gets chopped down and turned into a table, all it can be is a table or something less than a table. Firewood. Firewood, burnt up. Yeah? Trash. What I'm teaching you now is you know, medically proven. I mean, I had to study this stuff. All I could say where I was. And where I was got significantly uncomfortable that I finally chose to get out of there. You know that place that we, we call comfortable? Yeah. Sitting on the nail. The nail, Eric's nail. You're sitting on Eric's nail and it's down here and you're in Czechoslovakia. You're in your comfort zone. By the way, how comfortable is one's comfort zone when you work out that you're in it? <laughs> miserable. Well, damn right. And if you're in it, I want you to be damn miserable because you deserve to be miserable. If you've got a hidden talent within you that you're not screaming and letting the light shine on, then you deserve to be miserable. And I condemn you for staying where you are. Or you can take what's being offered for, for you now, this day, this weekend, and take action. Action to take you out of where you were. Because I tried this. I tried this, guys. And I'm a pretty competent, determined guy. And I couldn't do it. Here's, I'm a farmer. And there's a saying, if there's a hole there, right? You know what, I'm going to, no, I'll, I'll stick with the same piece of paper because paper's expensive, no. I'm a farmer. If you're down a hole, Stop digging. Because <laughs> I wasn't in, I wasn't in seven hundred thousand dollars debt when I came out of the avalanche. I was only about three fifty. But I, God, the things I did. I ended up doing um, knocking door to door and friend to friend. Ended up not being my friends anymore. Funny enough, I was flogging moisturisers and hair care products, doing network marketing. You know, pyramid. Yeah. How much do you reckon I was loving that? God, I loved it. Oh yeah. I mean, just randomly, for no apparent reason, I mean, it's not related at all that I was disgusted and hating my existence and justifying my existence with debt. By the way, I know this is, you know, you're, you're an exemplary mob, mob, but do you know anybody, maybe a neighbour, anybody know anybody who justifies what they do for a job through paying bills? <laughs> and the bills are from the past? And they're dictating their now? Yeah, yeah, I knew something like that. It wasn't me, but what this ran, I can't believe the connection, but um, here I am flogging moisturisers, hair care products and exfoliators, loving it, and then funnily enough, I, I developed a pulmonary embolus, travelled through my calf muscle, through my hip joint, which was fixed, through my lung, uh, through my heart, into, into, my, um, into my left lung, and now, boom! Now, I don't mind dying. But don't do it in front of your kids. That's just selfish. Especially when you are warned. And warned. And warned. And warned. There's a message for you guys. Somebody, the universe, God, whatever your higher being is, is tapping your shoulder, tapping your shoulder every now and then with a feather. And then maybe a pencil. And then maybe a, base, a baseball bat and then maybe a bus, and then maybe an avalanche. Who knows what it may be? But sometimes you just got to get in your soul and listen to you. And what I'm telling you right now was told to me in very similar terms at the Avenue Hospital, Windsor, Melbourne, and the doctor said to me, I'm only a doctor, but if I was you, I'd be you. <laughs> How's that for a lesson? If I was you... I'd be you. And my story tonight is just literally taking you through some snippets of this. Because if you think you're going to say to me, show me the money, show me the money, that's all I want. The, rea the reality is, the re where's my clicker going, by the way? Child, I always, move, I always lose my clicker. It'll be in this ice. Oh, you're a Ralphie, man. Um, 
Joel, you can put that up on the screen. But, um, um, you know, show me the money. If you're going to come and, say, and buy a program and think that this doesn't exist, I tell you what, if this story exists, then your human being, your beautiful being, your human being, you see what I said about the normalisation? A normalisation is when you take a verb and you turn it into a noun. That's a table. You're a human being. What's being? A verb. You are a verb. Start being a verb and stop being a noun. Okay? I am an engineer or I'm a nurse or whatever it may be. That's, no, you're not. You're you. And you are beautiful and wonderful and you can do anything. All we need you to do is believe it. That's all. And yes, I've got some incredible tools that will take you there. The first person who needs to know this is you. You with me? Because I was the last person to get it back then. Yeah? Because I was over here chasing this but not getting it. And so what the human being does, if ever there's a memory of guilt, uh, hurt, sadness or anger still in existence, then the human being will protect itself. Yeah, it's called the unconscious behaviour. So the unconscious mind is protecting you from that pain. Does anybody know anybody who's ever lost, lost money on the stock market? Yep. Or the property market? Anybody know anybody who's ever uh, had their heart smashed? Yeah, maybe a wife walks out with three kids after 18 years, something like that. Anybody know? Yeah? So maybe it smashes your heart. Do you think if a person holds on to that memory in their heart that it might travel with them into the next relationship? Yeah? And a little thing might trigger them to respond in a certain way? Yeah? What I'm talking about is the unconscious behaviour from past pain. And the only way to move forward is to go back first. The only way to go forward is to go back first. And what we do, and this is what I teach and what I run my mojo boot camps, is to go back and to revisit these incidents and erase them forever. And I, you use NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Anybody familiar with NLP? Yeah? And Quantum Linguistics. Quantum Linguistics tricks the mind to release the language around the decisions back then. And I obviously had some decisions back then around protecting myself. Because every time I started to get towards making money, I lost more. You with me? So show me the money. Really, the message that I've got for you is you want to get something in you, some essence, some life force within you. And this life force has been pursued by millionaires and billionaires and religious groups and cults for centuries. I think it was best summarised uh, by an Englishman, actually, an English philosopher, Austin Powers. <laughs> And the Austin Powers energy is about getting your natural energy and your natural energy is where the money will come from. And when your natural energy flows from within you, then the money will follow. And yes, you need good strategies, but all the blockages that you had before, they'll be taken away when you get past the past and allow yourself to live into the future. You with me? Yeah. So get your mojo here. And here, of course, is what I'm referring to. Get your mojo here. Now... What I'm going to take you through quickly here, and I'm only going to do a 55-minute you know, talk, and I've got 12, 25 minutes left, it's this. The first step forward is to clear your mind of the past. So the beginning of it is to have an open mind. Because when a tree is a tree, is it full of possibilities? Can it be lots of things? But when it's a table, is it somewhat limited? I want to take you back, in, back to the forest, back when you're a seed and then a tree, and then whatever your DNA prophesies, prophesies that you could be. Judgment. Judgment's about accountability. You having accountability in your life. Anybody, anybody ever set the alarm for a 6 a.m. run in the morning? They haven't got a buddy. They're going by themselves, and they've woken up, and it's raining outside, and they've not gone for the run? Lack of accountability. What I'm all about is accountability. Judgment. I couldn't get an A out of Mojo, so judgment's my way of saying accountability. The judgment is about literally putting a, a support network around you to make sure that you do what's got to be done. Objective, having goals to get there. And finally, and in this order, is money. And money comes last. And I'll touch that at the end here. So open mind means free of fear, fearless. And I, and I, and I, and I, show, I, I talk to you quickly about this. I want to talk to you in sort of scientific terms. What it is is... Can you see that screen? There's 2.3 million bits of information right now hitting your brain, like hitting you. 
That's the fact, right? Have you heard this before? A lot, right? So just imagine 16 double-decker buses are loaded up with A4 paper with six font print on it. It's full of information, and it's all trying to get in here right now. But the reality is your brain can only process 126 bits. Not 126,000 bits, 126 bits. Do you see a difference between that number and that number? What do you think you've got to do with the 16 um, buses of information? What's going to happen to get it into you? What do they have to do? Filter it out. Filter it out. And here's the filter. Delete, distort and generalise. And do you think if a person in the past has lost money or known somebody that's lost money or done this or done that, do you think that might affect how much they distort or generalise? And what they delete and what they keep? Absolutely. And after all this, it goes through their filters, values and beliefs, the language, the memories, the decisions, time coding, metaprogram. This is where I take you back and we revisit each of these filters and we recalibrate them. Just like your, your car needs a service every now and then, every now and then you need, you need a service and you need an oil change and get, and get this thing realigned. Because you know those pains, and I bet you, and by the way, I'm, off, I mean, I'm not selling you anything in particular tonight, I'm saying, you know, if you like what I'm talking about and you like what I'm about, you know, grab the information at the back there and get a time slot to sit with me tomorrow. That's all really I'm saying. I'm, at midnight, I'm not saying, you know, give us your credit card. I'm saying if you like what I'm about, take the information, digest it, and let's have a chat, okay? But the point of the story here is every now and then you need a retune. Re and what you'll find, I, I will give you your homework. When you do come and sit with me, can you tell me what your story is? I'll say to you straight up, what's your story? Uh, I was at a birthday party, I was five years old, everyone was there, and the budgerigar bit my thumb. And I cried. And that was okay, but then they laughed at me for crying. And now, I'm 28 years old, I'm at the Gold Coast, doing a workshop with me, and uh, her name wasn't Susie, but I'll say Susie. Um, my name is Susie and I can't go to the beach because outside there's turkeys and on the beach there's seagulls. So that's quite limiting, isn't it? But these decisions are made at a very mature age of somewhere around seven and then again at 14. It repeats itself and we've all done it. It's a limiting decision, it's called a phobia and you can get a phobic response. A phobia is an, a phobia is an irrational response to a constant stimuli and many people have got it around money. Making money is not hard, by the way. Does anybody, do you believe that? I mean, do you, do you, like, cerebrally, do you get that? Making money isn't actually very hard. It's really not. You talk to some very wealthy people, just knock about people who kind of got onto a good strategy and just did it. How about John Thompson? Now, John's my mentor. I, I was doing naked puts, he was doing naked puts, we got together and we created a program. The point of the story is, is that, the, is that what you got from John? He said, oh, I bought the Prime study and, um, you know, $3,000 and then I, did this, I just put $10,000 and I made $1,000 and whoosh, I sold the apartment and, and now I'm making $40,000. The point of the story is just do it. Like Branson says the other day at the, at, you know, at the event, I was speaking at the, Brant, the Branson event and there's Branson, he says, screw it, just do it. I want you to get to the place where you're screwing it and just doing it. So that's the model there of having an open mind, yeah? Getting past the past. And then again, oh, these are some images from the Mojo Boot Camp, um, which are on my phone. Oh, there's Natalie. Now, that's a good example. Now, Natalie, when I walked towards her with a, with a, um, uh, a tea box, a bushel's tea box, with a spider, that spider inside it, um, oh, Gussie, were you, were you there on this one? With, with this one? Was she, what did she do? <laughs> jumped out of skin, man, she was backflipping, fully backflipping, yeah? Now, how was she, I mean, this is obviously a real photo, how was she at the end? Sp loving spiders, right? And so that's called a, that's just an example of a, of, I, get, I, I smash phobia, so if you've got a phobia, I'll get rid of it like that, right? Um, but that's an, that's an example there. And she was backflipping to get away from the spider. Now, imagine if the spider meant, um, you know, getting skinny again, or getting prosperous again, or getting into a relationship again. The spider is just symbolic of how it limits one, a person. Oh, can you hear that? I 
I'll just show you some little examples as we go along. I'll click along a bit quickly. Um, so that's Mojo Boot Camp, which is at my farm on the 24th and 26th of February. You know, take note of the, of the date. Um, so here we go again. So we've done open mind. No judgment. Now, I'll tell you what, you with me? Has anybody ever had, had a coach and they got them to where they wanted to get them to? You did? Yeah? What was your example? Life coach, life coach yeah? Yep. And they really helped you get somewhere, yeah? Yeah, set your goals. And, and kept you accountable. Yep. Yep. Anybody else have a coach ever? Yep. Yeah, I'm coach. coach? Hey, you, did you see my kite outside? Oh, my kite's out there. So let's go for a sale. Sure. I was going to put it on the stage tonight, actually. You know why? Tax deductibility. Um, <laughs> uh, what's your coaching example? I have a couple of Yep. Yeah. And they keep you accountable? How important do you think that is? I'll tell you a quick story. So here I was. Um, I'd paid £10,000 to David Hempelman Adams, who was going to be my mentor to take me to get to the North Pole, to get the North Atlantic Pole. And I paid £10,000, which was um, you know, the money, which is $33,000 to do it, right? Anyway, um, a little thing happened. Wasn't, wasn't a very big thing, but um, a little hiccup. I, I scraped my knee and... Um, and um, <laughs> I didn't scrape my knee. I had a thoracic aneurysm. They cut me open from here, from my, le- my, from my belly button um, to my, le- my left scapula. And um, <laughs> I, ra- <laughs> I rang up David eventually asking for my deposit back. Because, um, you know, no way I could do it, of course. <laughs> you know what he said? <laughs> when the going gets tough, tough get going. Pull your finger out and turn this into something significant. Turn this into something for somebody else, not just you. Because I, po- I was all about Peter Bland, pole to pole, pole to pole, South Pole, North Pole. This is been- this is no, no, no. Turn it into a story, a story of significance, a story that helps others. And so I did. And of course, you know, the ABC got behind it and I was Australian story back in 2002. But if I hadn't shifted to that charitable cause, it would have just stayed me, 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 and woe is me. And if I didn't have accountability from him, I would still be metaphorically back there. You with me? Anybody know anybody who's got a story which is significant, significant enough for them to still hold on to it? Yeah, plenty of people. And what you need is a great big bit of gel, gel ignite every now and then to shock you to get past it. So again, going going in. Obviously, you know, there's heaps, heaps of examples. I just thought that with each letter of the uh, mojo, I'll just give you one example of, you know, people who... I mean, this is why I live. I really believe now that my purpose is to literally get past fear. The biggest fears, uh, personal identity, public speaking and money. Uh, we do a lot of work at the mojo boot camps around that. I feel that's... I mean, my body's riddled with scars. There must be a reason, must be a higher purpose why a person falls 50 metres... Not on the snow, on the hardened ice. There must be something going on here. So I chose, after network marketing and chasing money for five years and getting sicker, that I chose to become me, you see? And I'm just an adventurer with a message. You know what a message is? If I was you, I'd be you. That's my message. And if it's being an adventurer, then be an adventurer. I'm an adventurer and, you know, a ski pass costs money. Time away for four months skiing costs money. Things cost money, I admit that. So get an income source that can support your lifestyle. If you've got an, if you've got an expensive lifestyle, then get a jolly good income strategy. And I've got that as well. Okay? And mine was only developed because I, ru- I cost a fair bit to run. <laughs> <laughs> All right? I'm being honest, so it is, you know? So I, I believe that necessity is the mother of invention. So again, those dates for the Mojo Boot Camp. So again, we're back with Austin Powers. Open mind, judgment, objective. I touched before about the charitable component. I want to talk to you about that now. Literally this, I'm sailing with David 
So a year before the heart operation, I'm sailing with David on my way to the South Magnetic Pole. You know Mawson's hut? Sir Douglas Mawson? Sir Douglas Mawson was the first Australian to the South Magnetic Pole in 1908. And I'm sailing with David beneath the southern aurora on a 60-foot yacht. We're doing about 40 knots, just screaming, maybe not 40 knots, it felt like it, screaming down these, these, these uh, mountainous uh, wave faces. And I says to David, I says, David, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the first Australian to the North Magnetic Pole. Notice the word I'm. I'm going to be the first Australian. The North. And he says to me, is that all? <laughs> I said, North Pole, I'm going to be. And he goes, is that all? He says, blue, he used to call me blue when I used to have hair. Unless you turn your life into a cause, all you'll have is what you've got. Turn your life into a, li- into a cause. Your life is a cause, a charitable cause with focus on significance. So at the end of the day, if you were diagnosed with cancer now and you had five months to live, I bet you you wouldn't go out there just chasing money. I, think, I bet you you'd switch your mind to thinking about footprint, impact, impact on the world and experiences. Don't you think? Well, that's what I'm just tricking you now to think about because that's what he said to me. He says, is that all? And that's when I learned the lesson to literally focus on the true wealth. The true, whoops, the true wealth, always have a channel. There's David there, North Pole Expedition, seven summits, four poles, 42 ballooning rare workers, work with Prince Charles and the Princess Trust. Another example here with Dick Smith. You know, there's Dick Smith. I mean, Dick Smith is the one that started the Variety Bash back in 1985. You'll notice a commonality. What about Branson? You know, $3 billion for global warming. Do you see what I'm saying? This, there's, a co- there's a correlation. Do you know people in your own community who are very giving, charitably orientated? Do you know people? There's a real correlation between giving and receiving. And I'm just really asking you now from a guy who's, well, I mean, I, I, mean, I have raised $40 million for charity. I haven't given $40 million, don't get me wrong. I've raised $40 million for charity. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, it wasn't my money. I mean, I, a bit of it was, to, enough to get it started, but then lead by example and then get them following. And that's why at the boot camps, I'm all about public speaking. Tell you what, I'll have you so eloquent as a speaker with passion because passion sells. And when you're getting somebody to follow, you're selling something. You're asking them to contribute also or get involved or roll up their sleeves. Huh? So I'll give you some examples um, in the, what I've been involved in. Of course, you know, what was the switch from there from there, well, the moment we did that, you see, the moment I went from there to focusing on every, every school child in Australia wearing a heart rate monitor to work out how many times my heart beat from base camp to the pole, it switched, you see. Equally, um, there's, Jamie, there's Jamie McIntyre and a whole bunch of us. Um, oh, Robbie's not here, but who else? Louis, there's Louis in there and a whole bunch of us went to Antarctica early last year and I ran this expedition. And again, the charitable contribution is being involved with an equine therapy program that I've been involved with for years over there in Argentina. So, and people say now, years later, and this is from previous years, they said the highlight of their entire expedition to Antarctica was not Antarctica. Even though it was incredible, the highlight was working with the kids. Wow, that's incredible. Um, now, with Mojo Life, pay it forward because we all deserve to live. Melissa and I are sponsored an orangutan called Sen. And you know that orangutans in Borneo, uh, it's, I mean, it's disgusting. They have their, their mothers are having their hands chopped off. You heard about this? It's disgusting. A, for the delicacy of the orangutan hands, and then also um, their, their habitats being annihilated for more uh, uh, pine plantations and sugar plantations. Anyway, whatever we do, whenever we have a charitable contribution, we end up you know, running an adventure trip to, to there. So we go over there, we do an adventure trip, but we roll our sleeves up and really hook in. So who's interested in doing something like that you know, with me in the near future? Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's down the track, but you're not ready yet because if you've got baggage, you can't bring it with you. <laughs> get rid of the emotional baggage at my farm and then you can come, all right? And then I've also got to get, could I put a financial plan in place for you. So get rid of the baggage, get the financial plan, and then you can come. Is that all right? Hands up, that's okay? Good? Right, yeah, good. Oh, that photo just there, by the way, that's the fire of truth. This is people at the, at the, at the boot camp. And there, by the way, is my beautiful fiancée, Melissa, over there. Hello, Melissa. She's saying, 
<laughs> There's Lissy, and we're running, this is Lissy and I um, tag teaming, pay, taking people through all their past fears, rebirthing. I'm not sure how much of that you heard, but you, what did you hear him say? No fear. no fear at all. And the money mindset, all clear to go. I'll show you a, I'll show you a clip with, um, with Anthony in a second. He's averaged 7.7% every month this year. Um, he went there, he was scared like a, like a puppy dog that had been beaten, yeah? And just transformed. Um, so again, all, of that's, all that's covered in the... Again, I haven't talked much about the Lucky Life formula, but let's talk about it when we have a chat because I'm conscious of just doing this nice and quickly tonight. Um, all, that's, all that's covered in the material. So again, we're coming to the bit that you really wanted to know about, the money. Is that right? True? Now, the next part of the component is this. Actually, just, just before I show you anything about money, you've got to stand up quickly and then sit down quickly. Is that as loud as it goes? Up and down. And up and down. And left, and right, and left, up, right, up, both down, both up, and down. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Round of applause for you. <laughs> Show me the money. Right. Now, there's a reason why Jamie's got me speaking prime, rel prime time, 3.30 Monday afternoon because this strategy rocks, okay? And I'll just say this to you. If you had a choice between, if you had a choice, now you heard, just see how much you understood when John Thompson spoke earlier, but if you had a choice between um, buying a share at 36, and renting it out, and renting it out at 37. You with me so far? Yeah. And receiving, let's say, let's say, you know, 60 cents, right? Don't quote me on numbers, just just roughly, right? If you have the choice between buying the share and renting it out at 37 and receiving 60 cents, or making a promise to buy it at 33, both in a month's time. That's one month from now, and that's now, and you also get paid, I'll, I'll reduce this, I'll say, I'll say 50 cents. This one requires you to buy the share first. This one doesn't require you to buy the share. You're making a promise to buy it, not buying it. Which one's riskier? Buy the share. And you're, a, you're an option trader. You do what I do, don't you? And you get this, yeah? Why, why is this so much less risky? Because I don't own the stock and you get to write that option and the promise to buy the stock way below the current price. And, and still collect the premium. And still collect the premium, thank you very much. And woe is me, woe is me. Oh my God. I got exercise. You got a discount. At a discount. You bought a $36 stock at 33, which on the day was trading at 33, I'll give you that. But we have a history, we know each other. Eight times or nine times, in that order, out of ten, what's more likely to happen next? Now you know that shares fall down the, fall down the window and they go back up the stairs, you know that, don't you? So this might take a month or more, so that's two months. How much of this do you keep? 100%. Sweet. How much is that? $3 capital profit plus the 50 cents. Right? Am I making sense? And I'm just giving the, the, the real lowdown. And by the way, if you're a good real estate company, or not real estate, if you're a good insurance company, and... Um, what kind of things would you insure? Kids, kids bicycles? Would you, 
well, you know, houses, cars. Let's go with this kid's bicycle. Why, why wouldn't you insure a kid's bicycle? It's going to get broken, probably get stolen, it's devaluing and the kid can't pay. Okay? So you wouldn't do that. <laughs> so what would you insure? Assets. Period. Assets. Assets which the value is known and it's going to be there at the end of the year too. Yeah? Well, what we do here is we insure assets. And by the way, if you're an insurance company, would you, um, would you insure all your houses in Christchurch? Why not? Or, or Brisbane next to the river? No. So what could you do to mitigate that risk? Diversify. Well, if all of a sudden this is only costing you the deposit, called the margin, is costing you somewhere between 10 to 25% of that value, with the same dollar, couldn't you have maybe six to eight positions for the same dollar? As that? Am I making sense? Well, there's diversification. And anybody who is not exercising diversification in the portfolio with this strategy is a fool. Okay? I have 20 positions, more, give or take, every month. I've got a you know, big capital, but yeah? So minimum 10 anyway. Okay, now that's a, nut, a, a real quick version of what I do and what I teach and what my students are doing. But you know what? That's not where the money is. <laughs> I'm going to show you something else. You, you want to hear the next bit? Yeah. Okay. Where's my clicker? So money. Um, good. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to end on this. It'll be about, about four minutes and, then, and then, we'll, then we'll end, okay? You, you enjoying this? Yeah. Good. Maybe I'll be six minutes. Okay. So here are all the members you know, this year. And oh, here's some examples of some students. Um, yeah, we turned 90% this month so far. Well. Um, we've got a fantastic and you're, you're trading with a fairly small account and that's 9% after commission. Yep. Um, it's been great. The uh, support's been great. Uh, we've got and uh, it's been very profitable today. In my first month, I've made uh, about 7.5% uh, net return. So, and I told you that's not where, even 7%, 10%, who cares? That's not where the money is. That's not where the money is. Seriously, guys. There's more money to be had. Does anybody know anybody who's ever lost money by holding property and never selling it? Ever. Is it your grandparents. Like, what, what do they buy their place for? What, your parents. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're talking about in Melbourne, like Port Melbourne, that was the impoverished immigrants, fishermen. Well, God, what's it worth nowadays? You know what I mean? Anybody who could afford just to hold their own home. But here's the challenge, and I'm going to go super quick, because I am speaking about money on, on Monday, but I'll just give you a quick, quick version. Okay, look at this. Oh, I've read Steve McKnight, and it told me that I should have eight properties before I retire. Okay, no worries. Property number one, property number two, property number three. Oh, my God. Well, nobody told me this. The average cost of holding a property, now don't quote me, but let's just be generalised here. The average property costs about 7% to hold. Is that fair enough? You know, the mortgage payments and so forth. Yeah, give or take. Okay, the average yield, that's, I'm being generous by saying 5%, you know, the, the, the tenant paying rent. So what do you notice about the two numbers? Minus 2%. Minus 2%. So who's paying the 2%? Where's the 2% coming from? Out of your pocket. Now, what do most people do to do that? They can't use the, you know, every property doubles every 10 years. They can't use that because they don't have the knowledge. The bricks aren't going to pay the mortgage. The bricks are bricks. They've got, mortar. They've got mortar. They're right in front of their face, but they haven't got a strategy like this. So what they're doing is they're doing nothing about it. And what they do is they go, okay, well, that sucks. I'll just work harder. I'll give you 10 hours. You give me 100 bucks. Fair enough? I want $1,000. I'll give you 100 hours. Well, I'm on property number three. I'm looking for $5,000. Where's it going to come from? The missus isn't talking to me. I'm not seeing the kids. I've got my cholesterol through the roof. And this is, hey, look at the modern world. Lack of knowledge. They haven't, and that lack of knowledge and fear. Okay, so that doesn't work. So they're unhappy, okay? So maybe there's something better. So let's go with a different version. 
Same model, same model, but this time we're going to do it with some knowledge. Okay? But can it? Here, yes. All we need to do is beat the banks with opium. Now, being a drug dealer apparently is a very good business. <laughs> now, what does opium stand for? So, what's the one thing that banks will always lend towards? Assets. I'll give you a hint. What will banks always lend towards? <laughs> houses. The safest houses. What kind of rate will they, you know, up to what level will they lend? 95 even sometimes, yeah? So when you put down 10% onto a property and it doubles every 10 years, how much have you actually made on your money that year? 100%. Because if you put down 10% and the thing's worth 100,000, at the end of the year it's worth 110. But you only put in 10. But the trouble is most people can't afford to do that lots and lots and lots. I can. And people who do what I'm doing can because what they do is they do this. They go, hmm, property number one, equity. Draw equity out. Hmm, put equity into a line of credit. Line of credit through what I'll teach you to do on Monday. Boom. That makes enough money that I can pay. Oh, it's just off the screen, unfortunately. It says 2%. 2% gets paid off over there. It's just off the screen. 10% on the next property. That's your deposit for the next property. Lifestyle. Buy back some time. Equity, bigger. So you go into the next period of time with a bigger, with a bigger trading account than you had the last period. So what do you do? You do more of it. Boom, 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 2%, next property, more lifestyle, more equity. Boom, you get the point. That's where the real money is. Real money comes from never selling. But why do most people lose money with property? They panic sell. They sell too early. And the only reason they sold too early is they didn't have a strategy like this. You see? How good would it feel for you to have a passive income model like this? That you just laid out property per year, property per year, just doing its thing. All the negatively geared, by the way, there's, a, there's a, a general rule of thumb. The more negatively geared a property is, the stronger the appreciation. That's a general rule. So sometimes if you go looking for properties and they're, they're you know, um, income guarantee, that's a lot of lot hot air, okay? You want to get, you want to get properties that have got in, integra, in, integral value that appreciates. And sometimes they have to be negatively geared. So, in summary, that last photo very much summarises why I'm here tonight talking to you. That photo is taken of, of Mark and his son Nicholas when I was back and I came out of the hospital bed and I came home that night and I said, I'm back. I said, yeah. And you know what? I've got a dream. Yeah? What's your dream? I want to teach leadership. Wow. I'm going to start with fathers and sons, father and son relationships. And that was my first journey to Patagonia, taking middle-aged bankers and their privately school-educated 14-year-old sons and teaching them to do the dishes and have manners. <laughs> that was a challenge, yeah. <laughs> but you see how it evolved? So I started taking quite expensive trips away. And so to fund the trips for people, I then ended up teaching them property initially and then about, about um, naked puts. <laughs>